Hey there, my fellow YouTubians. I bet you didn't know that before Bella Swan moved to Forks, uh, she and her mom moved to Manhattan where they were going to live in a brownstone. But the first night they were living there, they were beset upon by a trio of nefarious uh, home invaders that wanted to um, pull some valuable stuff out of a safe that was hidden in this room that no one was even supposed to know about. Well, after that excitement was all taken care of, she decided to move to the Northwest where all she had to deal with was vampire boyfriends and uh, uh, werewolf suitors and the revelation that she's actually a fairy or something like that. Oh, wait, sorry, that's that's true blood. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so anyway, Panic Room. Uh, obviously, uh, Kristen Stewart um, plays the daughter to the main character uh, who is a recently divorced uh, woman who has moved to a new location, a new home uh, in Manhattan. Um, and originally the uh, main character was supposed to be played by uh, Nicole Kidman. Um, but uh, she was still uh, hurting from uh, shooting uh, Moulin Rouge and all those tight costumes, so uh, she drops out and Jodie Foster steps in, which is kind of funny because Jodie Foster was originally going to play Michael Douglas's sibling in the game, but when the script was rewritten for it to be a younger brother instead of sister, uh, she dropped out and Sean Penn came in. Uh, so it's a whole musical casting type of thing right there. Um, so Panic Room is a uh, a movie that came out um, in the spring of 2002. Uh, it was a little bit of trivia. It was the last film that David Fincher uh, shot on film. Uh, and then five years later when Zodiac came out, that was his first movie that he shot with all digital cameras. And I presume that he spent a lot of that intervening time um, doing a lot of tests to see which camera produced the best image that he liked. And I say he chose very wisely because uh, both Zodiac, Benjamin Button, and The Social Network, which is about to come out, uh, in just a couple of days, um, is all shot with digital cameras. Uh, uh, it's called a Viper, the camera that he uses. Anyway, so, Panic Room. Um, Jodie Foster is the mother, Kristen Stewart's her daughter, and they move into the brownstone, and then the guys come in who want to steal the valuable stuff, which just happens to be located in a safe, which just happens to be in the Panic Room that Jodie Foster and uh, Kristen Stewart lock themselves inside for the duration of the movie. Um, so the problem obviously here is that the guys can't leave until they get the stuff, but they can't get in the panic room because it is solid steel on all sides. They just can't open it up. Um, and uh, unfortunately, since they can't leave until they get the stuff, Jodie Foster and her daughter cannot leave either because once they step outside of that room, they will be vulnerable. Nice little um, psychological chess match here. Um, I uh, like this movie, generally. Um, it's not a very uh, complex movie thematically, unless you consider the theory that the three uh, thieves are, uh, pers are, are metaphorical uh, metaphors for uh, uh, aspects of the human psyche. Um, and it's been a while since I took psychology, but it goes something like there are three parts to psychology known as the id, the ego, and the superego. And the id is someone who just wants gratification, just wants stuff, uh, wants to satisfy its own impulses. And the superego might kind of be the polar opposite of that. And the ego is like the guy in the middle who's trying to keep the peace and trying to keep the balance. So that would be Forrest Whitaker there in the middle. He's the stable one. Uh, and Jared Leto um, from uh, My So-Called Life and uh, the 30 Seconds to Mars band, um, he plays the id, I presume, because uh, he's kind of a crack addict and he really wants his hands on the money. Apparently he was the guy who was taking care of the previous owner of the residence. Um, kind of a, a male nurse of some kind uh, and wants the money, of course. He, he found out about the money, so he's led the guys there to take it. And uh, Dwight Yoakam, the guy who's in the ski mask throughout the entire movie, um, is the uh, volatile and unstable and possibly uh, sociopathic one. And the only guy in the whole bunch who actually brought a gun with him. They don't expect, of course, there to be anyone living there at the time, so it becomes a battle of wills. Um, and uh, as far, it seems like this is David Fincher, to me anyway, David Fincher's straight, uh, m most like David Fincher's straight popcorn movie. Uh, it's pretty well defined good guys and bad guys and one bad guy who may not be quite so bad. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, um, you know, the conflicts and the escalation of tension. And then, uh, there's a resolution involving a big physical struggle at the end. So a fairly conventionally structured film, um, and, uh, 
from what I've read about it, he seemed interested in doing this movie because A, he wanted to do something that probably would end up making more money than his last couple of pictures, and it did. It was, a, it was a nice, sizable hit for him. And two, it only took place in one location. They built the entire building in a, a huge warehouse where they had the rain machines hooked up overhead so they could make you know, rain down the windows throughout the entire thing. They built the entire building in a little portion of the street so they could shoot it from all different angles. Um, and even though it took place only in one location, whereas in the, his previous film, Fight Club, took place in like 100 different locations, it still took six months to shoot because the planning of each one of these shots is so complicated. Uh, Fincher does this thing, and a lot of directors do that now, who do big budget effects films, uh, called pre-visualization, pre where they basically create a rough, crude, animated version of the movie, every single shot in the movie uh, on a computer, so they can figure out which shots need effects and which don't, or where the effects go and what have you. So Fincher took it one step farther. He created a completely accurate, miniaturized computer model of the entire building and its interior in the computer so that he could precisely choreograph every single camera move that he was going to do to make sure there was enough space between walls and corners for the camera to actually move the way he wanted it to. And as a result of this, by the time he actually came to shoot the film itself, he was kind of sick of it <laughs> because he spent so much time planning it. And now he had to stick to his plan and just basically go through the motions and shoot each shot. Um, aside, uh, given that, it's still a pretty exciting movie. Uh, it's got a great score, and um, the actors are all really good. It's a small cast, of course, uh, but uh, but yeah, works very nicely. And um, yeah, like I said, a, a pretty mainstream uh, kind of middle of the road uh, suspense movie, but uh, a well-made one. I also have to give props to the title sequence. Uh, Fincher became known for his really cool title sequences. And aside from Seven, this movie has my favorite opening uh, title sequence uh, in a Fincher film. Uh, I also, since we're talking about technique here, I wanted to uh, take a moment just to mention that um, before, uh, after he got his start as a visual effects cameraman on movies like Return of the Jedi, and before he started making feature length movies, David Fincher was very highly regarded in the field of TV commercials and music videos. Um, and in fact, some of the music videos that he directed uh, in the early 90s are some of the most well-regarded and, and iconic music videos in the entire field of music videos. So he got a lot of attention for that. There's a list that came out a while back on like the 100 most influential music videos and he, his name was on like at least seven or eight of them. Um, so I have actually gone and, I mean, anybody can look up his filmography on Wikipedia and find out what, what videos he does, but since some of them are already uploaded here to YouTube, I did a little research and have the links in the description below so that you can go through and take a look at some of that uh, earlier work of his, um, some of which, of course, I'm sure you've seen before, but it's fun. My recommendation is, is that since each link will open up a new window, you take the time to load each video before watching any of them and then watch them all in one go. At least that's the way I like to do it. I like to watch music videos in chunks of like six or seven and that makes it harder on the internet because you have to load each one individually. Anyway, um, so Panic Room. Uh, good movie, decent movie, uh, not terribly groundbreaking, um, but still well done. Some of the CGI in it is really good. Um, when they have the uh, big, huge, massive shots swooping through the whole building near the beginning of the movie, there's obviously CGI parts in which the camera will like fly right through the handle of a coffee cup or into the lock on a door, but that is blended very, very nicely with actual live action shots. Um, and where the CGI begins and the live action ends, there's just no way of knowing for sure. It's, it's very, very seamless. So technically, very amazing movie, uh, decent thriller, fun, all in all, I'd have to rank it like somewhere in the middle of, uh, of the movies that are liked uh, uh, by him. Uh, so that is my uh, take on it, uh, simplistic though it may be, and uh, if you wouldn't mind, also uh, there's a link to my partner in crime, V Rose, be happy, uh, who also has her review of uh, Panic Room for you to enjoy on her channel as well. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Ooh, and of course, we are also going to make an effort to review The Social Network, which is just about to come out. It's a movie that we're both very excited to see. So see you then, and take it easy.